All right, so let's. Uh, I know. Thanks. <laughs> let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. And uh, the book that you want to be looking at is Daniel, and the chapter is. Okay, the chapter is eight. Seven was last time, but we're going to touch on seven, and we'll touch a little bit on five, and we'll kind of work our way through, all right? Father, thank you for the chance to be able to look into your word and to learn from it tonight, and pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to the word as it's uh, uh, given to us, and pray, Lord, that you would encourage us from it. Others that might be coming, Lord, pray for safety for them and pray that you'd keep them as they slip in. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 5 of Daniel, if you're there, chapter 5, you remember the beginning of this. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the kings and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple and the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them, and they drank wine and praised the God of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. So what's going on in this chapter? What's the next thing now? I'm just trying to stir your minds and get you thinking and see if we're all remembering anything at all about this book. The writing on the wall. The writing on the wall. So somebody's going to get called into the room, right? And there's going to be writing on the wall and there's going to be all kinds of things going on there. When Daniel walked into that throne room of Belshazzar, he knew that a new power was going to arise to control the land where Israel was housed right then. Think about that. As he was coming in to interpret the writing on the wall, he already knew that somebody else, because God had given him the word, that somebody else was coming to power. Now, chapter 7, over a couple of pages, at least my Bible it is. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions on his head as he lay in his bed. Now, we're here in chapter 7, and we're seeing another mention of King Belshazzar. And uh, this is the first year of King Belshazzar, chapter 7. Chapter 5 is the third year, so we're kind of going backwards, if you will. Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed, and he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Do you remember this? You should. Two weeks ago, is what this is what we looked at. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different one from another. The first was like a lion. So this was in the first year. Now, chapter 5 was in the third year, and he was coming in to tell Belshazzar that, hey, your, your time is done, and uh, things are moving on. But Daniel already knew all of this, didn't he? He already had this in front of him. Daniel chapter 7 shows us four beasts, four animals, representing four kingdoms. Only one at that time had existed. What was the name of that country that had existed? That had captured them? Babylon. Babylon. What represented that? What animal represented Babylon? Do you remember? A lion, and it had what? Wings. wings. A lion with wings. Now, as we come tonight to chapter 8, we find two kingdoms specifically mentioned. 
chapter 8, and we're going to read a little bit here as we get started. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. Now let me pause there. Does any of that sound a little bit strange? Is, is Susa a city, the citadel, is it a city that we have heard up until this time? Mm -mm. No. No. Nope. No. Nope. Actually, Susa doesn't come into play for another kingdom or so. So there was a there was a place that was there. No. Oh, okay. There was a place that was there, but nothing of it wasn't a capital, it wasn't a power, it was just a city on a map, if you will, kind of like Noblesville. Oh, oh, there's Noblesville, just a city on the map. So as we start into chapter 8, where Daniel is, being, is talking about some things that weren't actually into major knowledge or existence or power or anything like that at the time. It was there but it wasn't anything major. He said, I was in Susa the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes, and I saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. Now keep this mind in mind, because we've got to differentiate between this ram and the animal that's coming afterwards. So listen and hold on to these things. I saw a ram standing on the bank of the canal, and it had two, uh, let's see, on the bank of the, it had two horns, and both, uh, on the bank of the, it had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Now, let me pause. Does that sound like anything that we've read? What? Okay, there was the fourth beast that had, there was the fourth beast that had ten horns, but there was something even before that. Let me read this again. There was a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns. Both horns were high. One was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. What other animal had something that was higher than another part of it. The bear. Ah. The bear had one side raised up. Now, that just talks about two things, right? Two sides of the bear, one side raised up. Here's the ram. It has two horns, one side higher, one ram horn higher than the other. This kind of seems to sound like that bear. What nation did the bear represent? Does anybody remember? Medo-Persia. Medo Persia came up after Media, and Persia was the stronger, and actually, we're going to read again about that, it kind of crushed the part of Media that was there, all right? Let's see what else is there. Uh, let's see. That was all verse 3, right? Verse 4. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was none who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased, and he became great. As I was considering, 
Behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth. Now let me pause there because the previous beast, the one that had two horns, which direction was it conquering? Was it going? <laughs> Okay, so it was evidently going from somewhere more easterly, eastern side. What's, our, what's the center of our direction always? What's the center? Where, where are we east, north, south from what? From Israel. And from the plains that are there and looking towards the Mediterranean, the sea that's there. So if they're heading west and north and south, they're heading towards the Mediterranean, north from Israel, south from Israel. What's down south of Israel? Egypt, Egypt is down that way. North would be up towards Turkey eventually, uh, and you get there. But now it says there's one coming from the west, and it's pushing east. So where's that coming from? Rome. No. Greece could be coming from Greece. We don't know anything about Rome yet. Um, and he says, uh, As I was considering this, male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. What does that sound like? Just throw something I, uh, idea out there. Any idea what he's trying to say about it? Wings? Okay, could be. Not touching the ground and the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. Conspicuous, what does that mean? Very noticeable, sticking out. So if we were to have a conspicuous nose at the front of our face, that would be a bulbous, a big nose sticking out. This is a horn, conspicuous, big, standing out there uh, from its face. And no one could rescue from his power, and he did as he pleased. That was the previous one. The male goat came from the west across the face without touching the ground, conspicuous horn between his eyes, it came to the ram with the two horns. So it's coming out of the west. The ram's heading west towards it. And the, the, um, the goat runs into the ram. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath. And I saw him come close to the ram. And he was enraged against him. And struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of the heavens. Now, does that ring a bell, the four horns afterwards and the and uh, the first one was broken off, and then four that took over. Anything that rings a bell there? Alexander? No, no, he had two. Alexander's Ragtime Band? Yeah, yeah. He was really good. Yeah. The leopard went in four directions. And it conquered fast, and it was powerful. And would that be the Macedonians? Who were Macedonians? Um, Alexander you, the Great. You mean the Greeks? No, he, they, he was in Greek. He was Macedonian. He was Greek. Macedon. Macedonia is part of Greece. So, 
So this is Alexander the Great, and he takes over that previous kingdom, Medo-Persia, and drives, and he could not be stopped. He did whatever he wanted. There was no one, verse 7, said who could rescue the ram from his power. And the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Remember the story, that was Alexander dying, right? And the great horn was broken, instead of it came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds. Now, let's, let's kind of look at some of this again. There's Why these two? Why did Daniel, now obviously, I know what you're going to say, I know what Fred's going to say, why did Daniel write about these two animals out of the four? Why did he do that, Fred? That's right. <laughs> the Holy Spirit led him to do that. But why these two? Obviously, the Spirit led, but why these two? The two nations involved at this time were filling in the land from the Holy Land towards the east. They were covering areas that were new. They included back into Greece, Macedonia, and uh, the southern part of Greece, and, and etc. So they were going on and doing that, but they were covering lands that... Um, became very important when it came to the gospel spreading. When Alexander conquered so much of the land, he decided there were a couple of things that he needed to do. Uh, one was he needed to make sure that that country could be controlled that he developed. Uh, how do you control a land that spreads that far when you don't have tanks and trucks and airplanes? What do you want to have to be able to move from one end of the land to the other? Well, some type of animal, but how is that animal going to move? Well, across the water would be an idea, but east of the Mediterranean, we don't have much water other than rivers. So they want to have good roads. When people moved into the United States, before it was the United States, they said, we've got to develop roads so that we can move towards the west. They went north, south, east, and eventually they went to the west. And so they developed roads. And Alexander built roads through this whole country as he conquered it. What else did Alexander um, spread as he conquered this land? Anybody know? How do you want to uh, take control of something? How do you want to be able to communicate? One language. One language. And so Alexander took the Greek language and spread it into this area all the way actually all the way to india so greek and eventually what we call koine greek the greek that the scriptures were written in went through all of this land and it became the force that helped christianity carry the gospel through this whole area as well as spread the language or the story of of jesus in Greek throughout this land. So all of that, of course, we know now. They didn't know at that time. But Alexander did that so that um, the gospel could go forward. You think Alexander did that for the gospel to go forward? No. Alexander did it for control. God used it so that the missionaries could go, so that the language could be spread, so that they could go on from there. In the Bibles that we read, the wording of the prophecy is factual and clear, but in the original, recorded in King James chapter, version, chapter 8, it states, 
In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, even unto me, Daniel. In verse 15, this emphasis again appears. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. And then as Daniel began to understand what was involved, he was emotionally worn out. Look down in chapter 8, verse 27. Now we're just touching on this. We're going to go back and talk about the rest of the chapter. And I, Daniel, was overcome, and I lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Daniel was given so much that was going to happen, so much knowledge about what was going to come, that it just blew him away. Think of this. What if God was to give to you and me about America what's going to happen next in the next 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, that would be overwhelming. Well, that's what happened to Daniel here in chapter 8. He was given stuff that it just kind of messed with his mind. Wow, what is God in the process of doing here? And yet Daniel was the one who was told. Daniel was the one who was sharing it. Daniel was the one who was going to take it and pass it on. And he was overwhelmed as he got all of this information. Now, I want you to notice something else, and this is where I handed out the verses, and we touched on this at the beginning. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 2, uh, Daniel's writing, and he says, I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. Now, somebody's got Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. Nehemiah. Hathaliah. Good job. And in this book I tell you what I have done during the month of Chislav. Chislav. <laughs> in the 20th year of Artaxerxes rule, Persia. I was in his fortress city of Susa. Okay. He was in the fortress city of Susa. Susa was not a major city by the time of Daniel. In, in, in Nebuchadnezzar's time. But it was after that. Okay? It was in the next kingdom. And so as he's dreaming about that, he's talking about being in, the, in, in this city that is not even yet, not a, not a major place, but it is going to be down the road. How about Esther, chapter 1 and verse 2? Somebody's got that one. There he goes again. He's, he's talking about places that were not major areas in his day, but had been and would be, and he, so he's giving them. Long before the Persian Empire began, even before Babylon fell, Daniel saw himself in the capital of the Persian kingdom. Before before um, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon fell, he already saw himself in the capital of the next kingdom. God doesn't leave things loose. God's planning. God's got things worked out. I think it's interesting that Daniel here, living in this area all along, being involved with Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and whatever, is already seeing the kingdom that is coming next and he is there in that kingdom as, as the prophecies are coming to him, uh, at least in his dream or in the, the story as it comes to him in that way. 
Daniel chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, we, we just touched on it. He said, I was in the, saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, <clears throat> which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. So he's seeing things that are yet future as he is in Belshazzar's kingdom in the third year of that, all right? God tells us who this ram is just a, a, a little bit down in the story in chapter 8 and verse 20. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And see, I forced you to try to come up with who that was. It's already there, so I'm not that smart. I just had read ahead. Uh, we are told that even before Babylon fell, the Medes stepped in, and then they were joined by the Persians, and in short order, the Medes disappeared by the power of the Persians. And they assimilated the whole Median kingdom into this Medo-Persia. And then after that, remember we saw a bear that had one side the animal raised up. We talked about that. That was two weeks ago. Well, we saw it again with the two horns and the one higher than the other. Cyrus the Persian and his son Cambyses II. I know some of these are not names that are in the scripture, but they're names that are in history that are there. Built the largest empire in history up to that time. All right. Now, as we come to chapter 8, verses 5 to 7, we touched on these already. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. He came to the ram with two horns. Remember, the ram is Medo-Persia, which had been standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in a powerful wrath. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and he struck the ram, and he broke his two horns, and the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Once, once Greece came into power in this area, once they conquered Medo-Persia is just forgotten about. Never comes back again. Never seen again. It was a huge power at one time, but eventually uh, it's wiped out. The first Greek colony, when it was established, came about being established by an oracle. Now, what's an oracle? A seer. A seer. Somebody who's seeing different things and they begin to talk about it. And this oracle sent a, said there was a goat that was guiding the people that were living in this area of Macedonia to where they should build their first city. The goat came to the region that we call Greece. And in gratitude for the ghosts leading them in the right direction, they called this city Age, A G A E. Now, interestingly enough, that means goat, goat city. It was goat city, so they named their city after that goat. Now, we're not done yet, though. We're going to ignore that, but we're we're not done yet. The name of the sea on the shores of which the city was built was called the Aegean Sea, which means Goat Sea. Now that sea is north off of the Mediterranean between what we call modern-day Greece, Greece, the Grecian Peninsula, and Turkey. And it's called the Aegean Sea, and it's the place where the battles went back and forth between Turkey, Medo-Persia, and Alexander and his armies. And so the Aegean, the Goat Sea, 
became dominant for years to come. So these are all things that, you know, from the stories that are told, come back and tie in to the scriptures. Now the Greek king, Alexander the Great, took this little nation from the Aegean Peninsula to the greatest, most powerful nation in the world at that time. He was concerned as he was growing up to have access to his kingdom, so he built vast highways and roads to all the provinces over which he had control. The Greek language had been spread to all the known world, so roads were finished that would take missionaries to all the corners of the known world. And the language unified was unified so the gospel would spread and was understood by all peoples. Now, when you think about that stuff, it's amazing that people question whether really God knows what he's talking about or God knows what he's doing. And yet, here's a book that was written so long ago that gives us the story of this guy who would come to power and uh, spread the, the uh, country uh, that he was ruling so that God's word could go forward. God used all of that. Do we question his power? Somebody's got Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8. So, is saying here, as he's talking to the writer, as he's putting it down, talk to me because I can give the power to conquer this whole world. I control all of that. He has got that power. And then Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he will, and he shall reign forever and ever. So, the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, the Son of God, and he will reign in all of them. God's got the power over all of these. And so when we read about the prophecies that are here, what was that? Yeah, that's right. It's exactly right. Uh, and when we see this and we see these prophecies that are here, we got we to gotta realize that God has told us that he's got this power. He's got this ability. And we don't have to worry about it. I used to, I, I was a history major in college, and I used to get all caught up in all of the different politics things here in the states and i would say oh if this person gets elected president what are we going to do and i would think back about a year later and i'd say good grief what whatever this guy said he was going to do god's still in control and we need to keep that in mind whoever gets into the white house praise god god's still in control and right now, I'm glad for that. But I've actually been glad for it in all of the years of my living as I look backwards and see that. Now, God being in control of this world kind of takes us to some things here that I want to point out. Five prophecies in this passage that are fulfilled to the minutest details. All right? Number one is the goat that is in chapter 8, obviously represents Greece. The large horn is its first king. Well, first king that we know of, his daddy was actually there before him. In 12 years, Greece conquered the entire civilized world. Alexander the Great was the prominent horn or the notable horn, and he had the reputation as an unbelievable person. Now, let me give you a little bit of background about him. 
He was, um, his mother taught him that he was a descendant of Achilles and Hercules. Now, these are obviously Greek, uh, demigods. well, demigods, but they're, uh, what are they? Myths. Myths, yeah. And that they go from there and try to build him up from it. He was fearful, Alexander was as a young man, that his father, Milip Philip of Macedon, uh, would leave nothing for him to conquer because he was quite a general and he was doing, uh, conquering the area of Greece and going on from there. Uh, but Philip of Macedon said to his young son, Alexander, he said, seek out a kingdom worthy of yourself. He said, Macedonia is too small for you. So Philip conquered Greece or Macedonia, the northern Greece, and then on from there. Alexander took the rest and then crossed the Aegean Sea and went east from there, destroying and conquering as he went. Now, the ruin of the Medo-Persian Empire was talked about in, in this chapter 8 as we read about it. They were, the horns, the notable horns were broken off. There was nothing they could do. They had no power. And that's the Medo-Persian Empire. Greece came in, Alexander came in, destroyed it, and left it for nothing. And then the death of the king is also talked about. Remember, it talks about that notable horn breaking off, and then four others that took over. At the age of 33, anybody here 33 or younger? <laughs> now, I'm not talking older, I'm talking younger. 33 years of age, Alexander had conquered everything all the way to India. And he got the flu, or pneumonia, and died. And he was done. Age of 33, he had conquered what they called the known world at that time. Now the four horns that replaced that great horn, they would not have the same power. From one of those kings came a kingdom that surpassed all the others. Uh, part of its um, coming was talked about. Uh, it came about 175 years before uh, Christ. But we're going to read down further and see what happens in the rest of Daniel's writing here. Look at verse 9. And we'll kind of go on from there. We've touched on some of this, but we'll read it and kind of get it as background going into the rest of the chapter. Out of one of those came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, towards the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. Now let's pause for a minute. Who do you think might be the prince of the host? Regular burnt offering was taken away from him, from the prince of the host. And uh, because of the transgression, it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. I think probably the, the prince of the host is not Satan, but Satan's power acting against it, where the prince of the host would be put down who would that be Christ who died on the cross and of course Satan thought he had won the victory right then I heard a holy one maybe an angel speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering the transgression that makes desolate giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot and he said to me for 2300 evenings and mornings then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. 
what number, what does that mean? 2,300 evenings and mornings. Two thousand three hundred days. So it's about three and a half years. That's about half the time of the seven years of tribulation. What verse did you have? Prince Prince of the Host, verse chap verse eleven. And there's nothing specific there. That's just a, an indication, a possibility. As you go on and read, and we're going to look at it, we find here that there's some talk about future things yet that we have not seen. Okay. So there's a jumping ahead seemingly from in Daniel here as Daniel hears some of this that we're going to see probably talks to the tribulation time, future yet. That's not revealed all of it here. It's just kind of some background that we're going to look at. We'll look at verse 15 and go on from there. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. So Gabriel here is telling Daniel that what he's seeing not only is partially fulfilled in the past, but there's some of it that's yet for the end times. That's yet future. And we had spoken to me, verse 18, I fell into a deep sleep on my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up. And he said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end on the indignation, for it refer, uh, refers to the appointed time of the end. So, looking ahead to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media, Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. And as for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I was over, Daniel was overcome, and I lay sick for some days. So, Daniel here is getting some truth about some things that had already have already taken place as we look back at them now. But he's also getting some little bit of glimpses of things that are yet future. He says, this is going to be things that are going to be at the end. These are going to be, um, let's see, where he talks about here... Um, Verse uh, 24, and destroy mighty men and people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand and in his own mind. It appears, some of the things that we see in Revelation, that talk about the Antichrist, could be being touched on here. 
But it's not specific. Why? Because that's not for Daniel in his time frame. He touches on it. He gives a little bit of it here. But we don't get the truth of it until we tie it in later on with some of the things that we're going to see in the New Testament. And Daniel's overwhelmed by this. He said, I was overcome. I lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Daniel's explained to us already what he has understood, how it applies to the uh, kings at that time. But there's some of it he doesn't understand. It's still yet future. Obviously, we don't totally understand it. We see parts of it later on in other prophecies. But we're just getting a hint of it right here. And then Daniel lets it go because that's all that God gives him. But it, it helps us, though, in the fact that what we're seeing here is, again, confirmation of the future. Of what we're, we may experience, but it also ties in, as, as what's the old saying, that the, the Old Testament is the, is the New Testament revealed. Or, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. New Testament is the Old but Testament. What that does is that confirms, though, when we read in, in Revelation, right? And this was written how many you know, years before? <clears throat> so you know, and again, it's just confirmation, and and, and that's for us, right? And it, we are able to see some things. We're we're going to talk here just a couple more minutes about some things that have happened in the past that are almost kind of a foreshadowing of what's going to happen. And again, we, we can't tie it all together, but we will take a look at it and see. Part of this was fulfilled 175 years before Christ. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about history for us, but for Daniel, it was yet future, and he had none of these names. There was a fellow by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, Blah, 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 blah. Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus means God manifest. Epiphanes. That was a Roman ruler who came to power after the time of Christ and sought to destroy the nation of Israel. He conquered Jerusalem. He killed 8,000 people in the city, 40,000 more were put into slavery. He substituted the worship um, in the temple with Greek worship that was done there. The Feast of Tabernacles. Does anybody remember the Feast of Tabernacles back in the Old Testament? Uh, it was uh, substituted and he took the Feast of Bacchanalia. Bacchanalia. Anybody know what that is? Bacchus, the god of pleasure. And that was substituted for the worship in the temple for worshiping pleasure, whatever you wanted. In fact, many who were brought into the place, even Jews who were brought in to, to be made fun of, were brought in naked for this time period and forced to be involved in some of the stuff that was there. He killed all kinds of people. In fact, many people, Jewish people, renamed him Antiochus Epimenes. Epim That's easy for you to say, which basically means the madman. But he was a picture. We know it's just a picture of what yet is going to come when we see the Antichrist finally. Why do we know it's a picture? Because not all the rest of the prophecies have been brought to, to bear yet. But we saw some instances that, of that tied in with it. There will be a king that comes in the later times. Daniel, without realizing it perhaps, speaks ahead of time to the time of the Antichrist when in verse 17 he says, the time of the end. So I, we're looking here yet at yet future things, but Daniel didn't explain it all because he didn't know it and he wasn't supposed to. 
Verses 19 to 27, we just read that, gives us interpretation for what will yet come and some things that have happened a little bit in there as they went on. So, chapter 8 is kind of a past hint at the future. And as we come to chapter 9 next week, we'll get even a little bit more as we start looking at uh, some future prophecies for the time of what we call the time of the tribulation. And uh, that's in the latter part of chapter 9. We'll touch on that as we go. Um, I can't give all kinds of answers, but are there any questions? I'll have Fred answer. Yeah. Oh yeah, unbelievable stuff. Well, unbelievable. What's, what's funny about that is just recently a couple guys from MIT were looking at um, some of the stru structures that are in Rome and why these things self heal. Structures like that, the concrete. And what it is, it was in the process of when they made it and they would mix it with lime. And somehow there's a process that they did that, what happened is when cracks were formed, they would release certain aspects of the concrete and it would actually form and, and almost glue itself back together. And this is something that was 2,000 years ago. And we're sitting there looking at this stuff and we, I mean, it's just like, you know, the, the, the uh, pyramid. We still don't really know how they could take these huge ton blocks and move them Stonehenge is another one because the quarry was like 50 miles away. And these were people five, supposedly 5,000 years ago. How did they do it? And, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, that when, when I was doing Rome, uh, the studies of Rome, that their engineering is so great that their, their roadways, when they built them, they're like six to eight feet thick. And that's why they're still here today. I mean, it's just astounding to think, you know, we look at it as oh, these primitive savages. But wow, I mean, Rome, when they when they started building ro roads, holy smokes, it, it was impressive. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there that w we need to understand that God gives people knowledge long before. Well, I mean, there's people that are... You look backwards and say, well, mankind couldn't do that stuff then. Well, they did. They did. And uh, think about it even in the time of the Old Testament. Think about it as they built the, the Tower of Babel and all of those type of things. That was a couple thousand years before this as we're reading it. So. Well, it was real easy. They had slaves, and they made them pull them. <laughs> I swear it's aliens. That's what they keep no, doing. don't swear. <laughs> I don't. I think you'll lose. I think you'll lose. Yeah. 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 city they they, they uh, Jericho they said that the, the, the walls were like meters thick. Yeah and the chariots would run Yeah I would run on top. I mean that's that's astounding. Yeah. Well <clears throat> we're done tonight but uh, I'm just using the one pastor uses on Sunday. English standard I think. ESV. ESV. It's interesting that you were doing that one on, on Daniel because when, uh, when you talked about... That's what we've been the yeah. whole time has been on Daniel. Well, when, when you were in chapter 23 <laughs> that's what it was, it said um, when he was exp explaining what this, this, this king was a king shall arise having fierce features. In mine, I use the New King James, it says who understands sinister schemes? And, and that, that was, it was a lot different than what you had, but it sounds more 
you know, the, the, the sinister machinations of, of somebody who just is, is, is just evil. Yeah. <laughs> but it is interesting, though, when they explain things of, of these other kings, and I think that's something that we have to look at, that this is going to be beyond our understanding. Just like um, uh, when Jonah went to, what was that city that he went in? in Nineveh. Nineveh. And each king tried to outdo the previous king in, in evil. I mean, that <laughs> what a legacy. Yeah. Wow, let's see what I can do that's worse than the king before me. Yeah. Jeez. Yep. All right, we're out of time. We'll close, and uh, we'll see you next, well, we'll see you Sunday, and then we'll see. I'll see you soon. What was that? Chapter 9. Chapter 9 next week, yep, yep. and we'll get you.